Chapter 23, Managing the Great Depression, Forging the New Deal, 1929-1939. So Chapter 22 was about the Roaring Twenties, the, the decade that just followed World War I and how, you know, it was kind of a wild time and people were spending money and making money and extending their credit and so on, uh, indulgence. Uh, but then that led to the crash of the stock market and that led to the Depression. So the 1930s, we're, so we're, we're moving forward a decade here to the 1930s. The 1930s is about the Great Depression, uh, which, of course, is the result from, from what was happening uh, in the 20s. Uh, so the realities of this begin to sink in. You know, the economy had completely collapsed. And, of course, many pointed at the excesses, the irresponsibility, the, the frivolousness of the Roaring Twenties. And that all vanished when the stock market crashed. And the only question left is, where do we go from here? What, what can we do? So it was a very bleak time, and it brought people back to the hopelessness of World War I. 9,000 banks closed, a, a huge number for that era. Same, same with this number, 100,000 businesses closed. I mean, that would have an effect today if 100,000 businesses closed, but not quite the same as back then, much worse. There's no work, there's no money, and here you see again a soup line, free soup, because people have to eat. Uh, the Depression was worldwide, didn't just happen here. And of course, the recovery was more difficult because the nation's economies were still trying to recover from World War I. Germany was still drowning in reparation debt. The rest of Europe, including France and Britain, trying to rebuild infrastructure. Uh, let's start this class with the film. Please watch the film, The Great Depression, Crash Course, U.S. History, number 33, and then come on back. Okay, so was, was Hoover to blame? Uh, he'd actually only been in office less than eight months when the markets crashed. Uh, so I can't imagine that something so, you know, terrible would happen that quickly. It takes a lot longer than eight months to have a, an economy collapse. But his response to it did, didn't help any. He, he believed that self-determination and hard work would solve the problem. Uh, any lack of confidence in the economic future or the strength of business in the United States is foolish. Uh, so that's, that's kind of your standard answer, right? And that's kind of an American point of view. Have, have faith, keep pushing, uh, don't stop buying, uh, you know, uh, stimulate the economy, uh, uh, we'll be fine. And the truth is, this was much bigger than, than just that, okay? Um, it, it, it needed more than just determination and, and hard work. Uh, it was deeper than that. Uh, the other side of it, uh, people were also claiming that the Depression was, you know, a, a kind of a moral response to the, what was deemed as the immorality of the 20s. Americans should work harder but also live a more moral life, direct response to the lifestyles of the 20s. Uh, but so, so for Hoover, you know, his response and, and you know, very similar to, to George W. Bush in 2008, have faith in the economy, uh, you know, don't worry. It didn't quite work out that way. Same thing here. Uh, the, the problems were deeper than he thought. And it would, it would require much more than just American pluck. So what do I mean by pluck, American pluck? Pluck is spirited and, and determined courage. And that's always a good thing. But many times, deep economic recessions take more than just hard work. Something has to happen to stimulate the economy. And you can, you've got to find a way to do that. Okay. But then, then Hoover blundered and, and made a huge mistake. And he pushed forward these the smoot holly tear but this would backfire uh in a in a huge way you, you see the headline there 1028 economists ask hoover to veto the pending tariff bill the smoot holly tariff so he was urged not to do do it by by many of his consultants but he did it anyway so what the smoot holly tariff did was implement a high tariff on imported goods and this was an attempt to stimulate American manufacturing at home that was, of course, hurt by the Depression, but it backfired. Other countries, mostly in anger, imposed their own crippling tariffs. 
and this ended up making things much worse. And this had an international effect. So the whole the whole world kind of came to a came to its knees in this depression. Uh, very interestingly, Hoover turned to the government to provide jobs for public projects. So this is something that Franklin Roosevelt is given the credit for, which he's the next president after Hoover. We'll talk about him at length here in this chapter. But Hoover's not given credit for this. And I, I think this gets kind of swept under the rug. He attempts to do this, to, to have the government provide jobs for public projects. Public construction projects, dams, bridges, whatever it might be, of course, creates jobs. And if people are working and making money, they'll spend money that will stimulate the economy. Uh, so this whole idea is, like I said, a precursor to Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. So Hoover, a Republican, conservative. He actually preceded Roosevelt, the Democrat and liberal, and this idea of modern liberalism. So, so what is liberalism? An ideology associated with free political institutions and religious toleration, as well as support for a strong role of government in regulating capitalism and constructing the welfare state. So, you know, free political institutions, religious toleration, that's very American, but they support a strong role of government in regulating capitalism, keeping it under control so that it doesn't run wild and, and take advantage of people, but also constructing the welfare state. So those last two items is, is what is, is where the conflict and the controversy comes. Um, uh, a liberal calls for big government, a, a, a big government that's got lots of programs, social programs for people to help them, get them on their feet, but also the welfare state where you're actually providing support for people that don't work. Uh, now, of course, back in these days, many people were out of work and, and had no money. So it came from it came from need. But of course, we still have the welfare state today. And it's criticized by conservatives <clears throat> as just a way to enable people to continue to live off the government. <clears throat> OK, <clears throat> excuse me. So modern liberal liberalism is about positive freedom. You know, individuals are able to pursue their personal development. Uh, they're altruistic beings with the, with the social responsibility, uh, empowerment of individuals. And the, and the last one I mentioned, an enabling state is, is needed to provide social conditions for everyone to enjoy positive freedom. But of course, the detractors would say you're enabling people to, to not get on their feet and, and, and go find a job or whatever it might be. <clears throat> you're allowing them to stay in their state by just by the government um, supporting them. <clears throat> so, of course, the opposite of liberalism is conservatism. What is that? A political philosophy that favors tradition in the sense of various religious, cultural, or nationally defined beliefs and customs in the face of external forces for change and is critical of proposals for radical social change. So a conservative likes things the way that they are, likes traditions, wants to keep things the way that they are, religious, cultural. Uh, and when faced with forces for change, they, they respond to that uh, and they don't want that. And, and they, they're critical of radical social change. So why would a person not want change? Because they're happy with the way things are. The way things are is working for them. It may not work for a lot of other people, but it works for them. So, of course, they don't want change. Uh, so a conservative believes in personal responsibility, low taxes because you don't have those social programs you have to pay for, limited government, not big government, small government. Okay. Just for fun, let's watch our next film. This is entitled uh, Liberal versus Conservative, 24 hours side by side. So understand that this is somewhat of a stereotype. The, the, the two individuals, the individuals that, that they use to compare, I would say, are, are somewhat cl cliche examples. Okay, go ahead and watch the film. Come on back. <clears throat> okay, so I don't think every conservative is a is a blue collar, you know, worker. Uh, and I don't think every liberal is is a, a gay person. Lots of people are like that. But you have probably the opposites. You, you have lots of uh, conservative people that are gay and lots of blue collar workers that are that are liberal it's but it's but the film is is showing you the extremes uh kind of a stereotypical extreme of of these two 
ideologies to show you the, the, the difference, okay? So, so back to Hoover. So, so Hoover was seen as the problem and seen as being asleep at the wheel. Uh, very similar to George W. Bush in 2008. You weren't paying attention. Suddenly the economy collapsed. It, 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 the, the depression in the 1930s was rivaled by what happened in 2008. Very, very uh, awful time. But George W. and Hoover work hard, stay calm. It'll work itself out, but it didn't in either case. So back to Hoover, the truth is, that, like I said before, the crash happened only eight months in his administration, so hardly his fall. But his ideas to get out of it did not work. You needed much more than just determination. The issues were much deeper. People were out of work, out of homes, lost your homes, and you have your savings. It's your, your, every, everything's gone. And where do they go? They, they, they come to shanty towns, which is a word that you heard a lot in those days. You know, people squat on a piece of land. They don't care if it's not theirs. We see homeless people today. We, we have a, a, a very large homeless problem. And we, we see more and more that they come together in groups and, and, and will we'll camp at a certain place. I mean, they've got to live somewhere. Of course, if they're together, you've got somewhat of security here. So these, these shanty towns became known as Hoovervilles to, of course, insult him. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be living like this. Uh, newspapers were used for blankets. They were called Hoover blankets. And like I said, these, pe these people had nowhere else to go. Where else do we go? We don't have a home. We don't have a job. We have no future. We have no money. Uh, an, an incident that happened uh, also made Hoover look very, very poorly here. And this is the Bonus Army. And here you see that they're also camping out on the, uh, on the grounds of the Capitol. Uh, so who were the bonus army? Thousands of World War I vets. Not that long ago, you had World War I. They come to, to Washington, D.C. to demand their pension payments that will be due to them in 1945. We fought the war. We agreed that because we fought the war and did our time that after we reach a certain age, we'll get a lifetime pension for fighting the war. But now the economy's collapsed. And we don't trust you. We want our money now. We, we want our pension now. And they come to the Capitol, Washington, D.C., to protest. We were the heroes in 1917, but we're bums now. Give us our money. We don't trust that you'll, you'll have it in 1945. Uh, so, so what does Hoover do? Now, understand who these men are. Okay, These are veterans that fought in World War I. These are heroes. But Hoover called out the army to remove them and burn down their encampment. So it's a sad day when the army is fighting with its own veterans. And these were older men. You know, many were injured. And people see this, so Hoover's popularity, of course, plummets. And by this time, it doesn't seem any chance that he'll be reelected. Uh... So the Great Depression is very important in our story of United States history. The, you know, the generation that lived through it would forever be changed by it. You know, then, then they would go and fight and win World War II, a huge accomplishment, you know, where, where you rid the world of, of you know, nasty leaders like Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. So the, the, the generation that survived the Depression and fought and won World War II are called the greatest generation. And, and that's a good name that they should be called that. Um, you know, they, they had challenging times and they came out on top. But the reason why I'm kind of going into this, I'm, I'm setting up the 1960s, which is coming in our class, uh, because it really starts right here. The, the clash of the 1960s comes from this generation and then their children down the road. Uh, the greatest generation's conservative values that were developed here in this in this uh, depression would clash considerably with their children's uh, values. Their children were called the baby boomers. Uh, this huge spike in, in births after World War II, not one, two. Of course, this conflict between these two generations would result in this very, uh, you know, conflictive decade of the 1960s. So the Depression was their 
first step in this journey. Let's go to our next film. This is probably the longest film I show in a class, uh, 27 minutes and 46 seconds. But it's interesting. It, it gives you, uh, you know, I could talk about the depression. I can read quotes from you about from people and you know, you'll, you'll get an idea, but to hear them, see them, you know, to feel their emotions when they're talking about their experiences, you know, I think it, 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 you know, is, is very useful. So please watch the film stories from the great depression and then come on back. Okay. So like, like I said, this was the first step for the greatest generation. And then next will be world war II. Of course, we're going to study that pretty quickly here. Then of course the fifties and sixties and all, all this comes together and really defines who we are today uh, and kind of, kind of how we got to be the people that we are today. Uh, so the film took you to Roosevelt's death, so a little ahead of ourselves. And we'll be talking a lot about him in this chapter. This is the era of Franklin Roosevelt, and his administration will change history forever. Uh, you know, as president, he guides the country through the Depression, and his implementation of social programs and the idea of modern liberalism is introduced to much success, but also much, uh, you know, uh, many people disagree. And again, conservatives versus liberals, you know, and, and the conservatives saw, oh my gosh, we, this, we, we are an absolutely liberal socialist government because of this man. So there's many people of that era that hate, hate Roosevelt for this. Uh, so this whole idea of liberalism, social programs is, is, was what, uh, what Roosevelt's first, uh, what two thirds of his, of his, uh, administration would be the thirties. But then of course he survives almost the entirety of world war II. He would die, uh, just before the war in Europe was over. So, so Roosevelt of course is, is the president during these two tumultuous moments. Um, and of course, an important person in American history. So let's go back a little and just set the stage for who uh, Roosevelt is. So the election of 1932, you you have uh, you have uh, Herbert Hoover versus Franklin Roosevelt, and of course, uh, you know, Her uh, Hoover never really stood a chance. Uh, the the country was just disgusted with him and the three Republican presidents in a row. Harding, Coolidge, uh, Hoover. It's time for a change. L look at the mess you put us in. We need a whole new approach. We need something different. So they, they, uh, the American public elects Franklin Roosevelt, and he campaigns on the idea that the country needs bold, persistent experimentation. So that's that's not pluck. That's not just keep on working and have faith. No, this is, a, we, we got to try something different. We, we got to, it's not working what we're doing. So let's experiment because what else can we do? We got to try something different. So perhaps borrowing from the progressive era, Roosevelt implements social programs to attempt to bring the country out of its slump. So again, not pluck, not determination. Roosevelt says up front, being very honest, we need to experiment to figure this out. This was new territory for everyone. And this is one of those paradigm shifts in American history when things change completely. And then after that change, things are never the same. Uh, so Roosevelt's elected, uh, but he starts at rock bottom. You know, the country's in absolute tatters, very much like Barack Obama in 2008. Uh, you, have a, you have a devastated economy and it's difficult for a president to come in with his visions for the country and his ideas you got to put all that on the on the back burner because you got to, you know, figure out a way to get people back to work and, and solve the solve the obvious problem. But Roosevelt comes in; he would he would change the landscape of American politics. Uh, again, one more time, officially bringing in the idea of modern liberalism that created the endless arguments that still go on today: Democrats versus Republicans, liberals versus conservatives. This is where it started. Big government versus small government. So, so again, big government, according to conservatives, 
uh, is excessively interventionist and intruding into all aspects of the lives of its citizens. It's not a good thing. But liberals would defend it by saying it's a government designed to help the people. Uh, so two points of view. We've talked about all the reforms of the progressive era. Uh, so And then it fell apart after during the war. And nobody really picked it back up in the 20s in, in any kind of huge degree. But Roosevelt's administ administration somewhat does pick this back up where it was left off. And he starts reform again. Uh, and start social programs to help America get back on its feet. Uh, one of the ideas he had early in his administration when he was first elected was the people have to trust me. They, they, they didn't trust Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, especially Hoover because of all that happened with him. They've lost faith in presidents and the politics and the government and leadership. So... Roosevelt decided, I want to appear accessible to everyone. I want to put them at ease. And I want to get them to restore their hope. I want them to feel like I'm part of the family. So he starts what were called fireside chats. So this is a different era. You know, families would, would get together and eat dinner uh, together as a family. And then when dinner's over, you listen to the radio. Because there was no TV, no internet. The, the radio was the big form of entertainment so roosevelt would would have these chats at at the time that dinner was over and what 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 people would do was you'd sit around the fire you put the radio on as a family and you listen to the president and he's just talking he's just talk like he's there so you have a personal moment with him and people start to you know uh, like him and see him as just one of us uh so of course all of this is the precursor to TV today, where you know, every president reaches out to the common man on TV. Uh, but it really starts with, this, with, with uh, Roosevelt's fireside chats. It was during one of these chats that he made one of his most famous quotes, We have nothing to fear but fear itself. But another reason why he did these chats sitting down was because he was actually in a wheelchair. FDR was disabled from polio. Uh, but he didn't want anyone to know. Okay, so in those days, he thought, you know, if they see me as disabled, in, in those days, they would call him a cripple. That's a derogatory term that we hope they don't use much today anymore. But in those days, it was seen as something that would hold you back. I don't think we see it that way today, but in those days, it was. So his, his aides would actually prop him up when he gave a speech standing up. Or typically, you'd always see him sitting down. He'd give a speech from a car, uh, from a t you know, sitting at, at a table. Uh, he really could not get up and walk around. Um, he could move a little bit, but he would probably end up falling if, if he was left on his own. So uh, Roosevelt didn't feel that, that they would elect him if they knew he was disabled. Would America elect a candidate that was disabled today? Good question. Uh, so, so Roosevelt implements all these many programs at, at great expense to the government. And how does America pay for all these programs? Tax hikes. That's big government. So, again, a liberal uh, government's going to implement big government, which means higher taxes. A conservative is going to eliminate social programs, which eliminates taxes or cuts taxes, taxes way back. So tax hikes are an inevitable and a liberal big government. Uh, but, you know, in, in this case, what would have happened without it? So remember what he said. We're going to experiment. We need to experiment. We, we need to find a different way here because what, what we've been doing put us in this mess. So, so Roosevelt comes up with these uh, very ambitious uh, uh, program called the New Deal. So we remember Teddy, his fifth cousin, uh, from what would that be, 30 years or so before this, uh, had the square deal. Now Roosevelt has the new deal. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So the new deal is Roosevelt's vision of America moving forward. And it was radical and it was different and it, and it was controversial and you had huge supporters and huge detractors. Um, and we'll talk more about these programs in the second half of chapter 23. That is the end of part one. Thank you.